Hello everyone, good evening. Please let me know if I'm audible and visible. And you're able to see the presentation. Okay, thank you. So let's let's start with today's session. So today's session is a short uh, MCQ discussion for the NEAT PG. This is like a mixed bag of questions, and um, I will be taking you through the questions. And I would be happy if uh, good evening everyone. I would be happy if you could just uh, put in the answers in our chat, and then we could discuss what are the answers. And uh, most of the questions are like slightly difficult clinical or case scenario based questions or image based questions so the idea is to um, to give you an uh, a sneak peek into what kind of questions can be expected but of course don't get disheartened just in case you cannot you're not able to answer the questions because not that all of them are easy some of them are pretty tough questions so let's start off with that so this is the first question a patient who uses minus 7 and minus 10 glasses in both eyes presents to the emergency with complaints of flashes and floaters. Now, what is to be done next? The options that we have are we reassure the patient and send him home. We do a retinoscopy for this patient. We do a direct ophthalmoscopy for this patient or we do an indirect ophthalmoscopy for this patient. So tell me, which is the option we should choose? He is a myopic patient. He has presented to the emergency with complaint of flashes and floaters. So what should we do for him? So tell me. Okay, correct. So you're telling me that this is the answer. That is indirect ophthalmoscopy. That is right. So that is the answer. Now the question is why? Why are we choosing this as our answer? So see, the patient is using minus 7, minus 10 glasses means he is a myo and he is coming to the emergency with complaint of flashes and floaters. Now, what do flashes and floaters in a myopic patient indicate? In a myopic patient, the complaint of flashes and floaters, it indicates the possibility of a peripheral retinal tear. It indicates the possibility of a peripheral retinal tear and if this peripheral retinal tear is not treated then it has the chance of progressing to a regmatogenous retinal detachment. So that is why when a myopic patient, see those of you who are myopes and who go for regular checkups with your doctors, you must know that Whenever they, doctors always, we always say that if you have suddenly developed flashes and floaters, then you must come for a checkup because that the flashes and floaters in a myopic patient has to be taken seriously because it may be suggestive of a peripheral retinal tear. And if a tear is not properly treated, then it can lead to a regmatogenous retinal detachment. So see, this reassure the patient and send him home is obviously wrong. This cannot be done. Retinoscopy is also wrong. Why? Because see, retinoscopy is meant for refraction so though the name of the instrument is retinoscope it is not meant for examination of the retina it is meant for refraction so retinoscopy is also wrong so we are left with the options of direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy so ophthalmoscopes are the instruments that we use to evaluate the retina now let's just look at these two instruments see this instrument this one this is the direct ophthalmoscope this is the direct ophthalmoscope. See, it has a handle and on top of the handle, there is a head. This is a direct ophthalmoscope. Whereas this one, this is an indirect ophthalmoscope. Now, the question is that why do we have two ophthalmoscopes? Now, the direct ophthalmoscope, that is this one, the DO, this has a very high magnification, meaning it allows you high zoom or high magnification. But because the zoom is very high, that is why the field of view of this direct ophthalmoscope is limited only to the central retina. So, the central retina means what? It allows you to see only the disc and the macula. That is the central part of the retina. Now, the indirect ophthalmoscope is exactly 
it's exactly the opposite it allows you to view up to the retinal periphery it allows you to view up to the retinal periphery but it has a much less magnification so direct ophthalmoscope has got high magnification but very very limited field of view indirect is the opposite it, it has got less mag but a field of view up to the peripheral retina so see in this question we are talking about a peripheral retinal tear meaning i have to look at the periphery of the retina so that is why i have to use an indirect ophthalmoscope okay so i will use an indirect ophthalmoscope because i want to identify this peripheral retinal tear and then what i have to do is i have to close this tear that is called as laser barrage laser barrage means closing that tear or that break with laser so that it does not progress to a regmatogenous retinal detachment so basically this question tells us that and if a myopic patient comes with complaint of flashes and floaters the possibility of peripheral retinal tear is to be considered that patient has to be taken very seriously we have to do a thorough examination of the periphery of the retina with this instrument that is the indirect ophthalmoscope and once we identify the tear we have to close that with laser that's called as laser barrage right so i hope this question is now clear to everybody right so this is like a case scenario kind of a based question now let me go to the next question next question is also similar a 60 year old patient presents with who has a history of heart disease presents with a sudden loss of vision and the clinical image is given now what is the treatment for this patient so see what are the options the options are wait and watch intravitreal steroids ocular massage and immediate paracentesis and intravitreal anti vegf so what will you choose as the answer here okay so what is the answer okay so the answer is c that is ocular massage and immediate paracentesis so what is the diagnosis first of all see they have talked about an elderly patient and there is a history of heart disease why history of heart disease has been mentioned to kind of highlight the possibility of some form of embolism and they have said that this patient is presenting to us with a sudden loss of vision and this is the picture given to us and what does this picture show see it shows you a pale retina with a bright red fovea the retina is pale but there is a bright red fovea this is what is typically called as a cherry red spot so cherry red spot right so cherry red spot in an elderly patient who presents with a sudden history of vision loss this is suggestive of correct creo central retinal artery occlusion so central retinal artery occlusion or creo now creo is one of the one of the ophthalmic emergency something which has to be treated immediately so obviously the first option is gone that is wait and watch cannot be the option because this is one of the ophthalmic emergencies it has to be treated within the initial few hours of onset and what is exactly the treatment of crao so in crao what you do is the the theory is that if you suddenly lower the intraocular pressure then that creates a jerk effect and this jerk effect can dislodge the trauma so how do you do that that is done by a vigorous ocular massage which can be done either with your fingers or it can be done with a gonioscope so a vigorous ocular massage so when you do a vigorous massage there is an increase in the outflow of aqueous and this can suddenly lower the intraocular pressure and create a jerk effect also you can do an immediate paracentesis what is paracentesis paracentesis means aspiration of aqueous humor from the anterior chamber so you take a needle with a syringe you go into the anterior chamber and you aspirate some aqueous so this also will suddenly lower the intraocular pressure create a jerk and this can help to dislodge the trauma so that is why this is the answer. right so this is see this clinical case scenario and this image it gives us a diagnosis of crao and the treatment of crao is massage and paracentesis therefore this is the now many of you have thought of intravitreal always whenever i put i put up this question lot of students think about intravitreal steroids and anti vegf says the answer now see intravitreal steroids and anti vegf these are used these may be used in the treatment of crvo at some point but not crao crao is not treated with all this this can be used at some point in the treatment of crvo treatment options may that may be possible but not for crvo 
okay so this is the second question again another clinical case kind of a question let's go to the next a 60 year old patient with a history of hypertension presents with sudden loss of vision now the clinical picture is given what is the diagnosis so the options given to us are crao brao crvo or retinal detachment so what is this Good. I think this most of you know, this is CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. So once again, see there is an elderly patient, there is a history of hypertension, there is a sudden loss of vision. And when you look at the retina, see what you see in the retina, you see that the whole retina is full of hemorrhages. So in a venous obstruction, what happens is because the vein is obstructed, there is a back transmission of the pressure to the the smaller vessels that is the capillaries and these capillaries are unable to withstand the pressure and they rupture and the whole retina becomes filled with hemorrhages. This is correct. This is what is typically called as your splashed tomato appearance. So this is typically our splashed tomato appearance and another name of this is the blood and thunder appearance. So splashed tomato appearance, blood and thunder appearance and this gives us a diagnosis of CRBO, central retinal vein occlusion. Okay, let's go to the next question. A 35-year-old young male patient, so please read this question carefully. Huh? A 35-year-old young male patient with a history of smoking suddenly presents with decrease in vision and metamorphopsia in the right eye. Sorry, we should say that it is in the left eye. This is the picture of the left eye. There is a localized neurosensory detachment at the posterior pole and the FFA shows a smoke stack pattern and this is your picture. Which is the drug that is contraindicated in this patient? Which is the drug that should not be given in this patient? Okay, so first of all, let us look at what is the diagnosis. They talk about a young male patient. They talk about a young male patient there is a history of smoking. Then there is a history of sudden decrease in vision and metamorphopsia. And there is a neurosensory detachment at the posterior pole. So see, there is a localized detachment of the neurosensory retina only at the posterior pole. Now, if you do an FFA for this patient, then it so shows a smoke stack pattern. Right? Now, what does all this point to? What is the diagnosis? What are the pointers in the questions are very strong. Young male patient, history of smoking. There is a neurosensory detachment that only involving the macula and an FFA shows smoke stack pattern. This gives us a diagnosis of CSCR or CSR that is central serous. The old name was central serous retinopathy. Now we say central serous chorioretinopathy, CSCR. Central serous chorioretinopathy or CSCR. Now, why are we calling this as CSCR? Central serous chorioretinopathy. This is a localized detachment of the neurosensory retina only at the posterior pole. So, only in the area of the posterior pole, there is a neurosensory detachment. And this is typically seen in young male patients. And the risk factors for this condition, they are represented by the three S's. So, can anyone tell me what are the three S's? One, of course, the question has told you it is smoking. Then the next S is steroids and stress. So this is typically seen. These are the three important risk factors for the development of CSCR. Smoking, stress and steroids. And what is it? It's a localized detachment of the neurosensory retina only at the posterior pole due to accumulation of a serous fluid. And this serous fluid is coming from some leaking blood vessel. And that's why when you do an FFA, that's a fundus fluorescein angiography, you see a leak of the dye at the posterior pole typically which is called a smokestack pattern. So all this gives us a diagnosis of CSCR and see in CSCR we have learned that the risk factors are smoking, stress and steroids. So therefore in this patient steroid is completely contraindicated. So the answer is steroids. Okay, slightly tough question. Let's go to the next question. A patient is diagnosed with high-risk PDR in both eyes. 
what should be the first line of management so what are the options pars plana vitrectomy intravitreal anti vegf span retinal photocoagulation intravitreal steroids so the patient is diagnosed with high risk pdr what is pdr pdr is proliferative diabetic retinopathy proliferative diabetic retinopathy a patient is diagnosed with high risk pdr that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy and what is the first line of management for this for this correct it is prp that is pan retinal photocoagulation pan retinal photocoagulation or prp this is the first line of management for high risk pdr that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy so see in this what the, what this question is trying to ask us is if it is a case of npdr that is non proliferative diabetic retinopathy then we do not give ocular management to this patient we concentrate on glycemic and metabolic control but once it becomes pdr and progresses to a high risk pdr then we have to start off with laser photocoagulation of the retina and this laser photocoagulation of the retina it has a name that is pan retinal photocoagulation now many a time students mark number b as the answer or number d as the answer intravitreal steroids anti vegf etc now please remember intravitreal anti vegf intravitreal steroids do have a role in the management of pdr but look at the question the question says what is the first line of management so therefore the answer is prp right so first we have to start our treatment with a laser photocoagulation and then only if it is not working or the response is not good enough do we move on to other options like intravitreal anti vegf if there is macular edema then you go on for these uh, these intravitreal anti vegf steroids etc but the first line of management for high risk pdr is laser that is why the answer is laser now students always feel that because the the root cause behind pdr is the vegf which has been released that's why anti vegf should be the first line of management no the first line is always laser then comes anti vegf okay so next question a 10 year old boy is brought to us with complaint of difficulty in night vision now the clinical picture is given to us what is the next investigation for confirming the diagnosis so tell me what should be the answer the options are ffa that is fundus fluorescein angiography usg b scan usg a scan or erg that is electro retinogram so what should we choose as the answer good the answer is erg that is electro retinogram correct now first of all what is the diagnosis see what is the complaint of the patient the complaint of the patient is nyctalopia that is difficulty in night vision difficulty in night vision or nyctalopia this is the complaint of the patient and what are we seeing you see these clumps of retinal pigments here these black black pigments in the mid periphery of the retina these are called as the bony corpuscles or the bony spicules these clumps of retinal pigments here correct so this gives us a diagnosis of rp that is retinitis pigmentosa so this gives us a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa now the investigation which is the confirmatory investigation the confirmatory investigation yeah um am i audible and visible just want to check if there is a network problem am yes right okay so see uh, this question is telling us that the, the the diagnosis that we arrive at is retinitis pigmentosa now the investigation of choice for retinitis pigmentosa is erg that is electro retinogram it is electro retinogram right 
Now, see retinite is pigmentosa, though the name is pigmentosa, but still it is a dystrophy of which layer of the retina? It is a dystrophy of the photoreceptor layer, namely the rod cells. So, it is the rod cells of the retina which are affected in this disease and that is why the complaint of the patient is night blindness or nyctalopia. So, when you do an ERG, an ERG is basically, it, it records the electrical activity of the retina after stimulating the eye with light. So, when you do an ERG for this patient, see normally the ERG looks like this. It's a graph like this. So, you have a down wave which is called as the A wave and this A wave it arises from the photoreceptor cells. Then there is an up wave which is called as the B wave also. Now, this A wave, because it arises from the photoreceptors, that is why in retinitis pigmentosa, this ERG shows a decrease in amplitude of this A wave. So, this down wave, which is the A wave, it will show a decrease in amplitude in the early stages and in the late stages, you will have a flattening of the A wave or ERG. Right? So, this is the investigation of choice to confirm a diagnosis of RP. So, see the pointers in the question are that it's a child. There is complaint of difficulty in night vision. The picture is showing us these bony spicules, that is these black clumps of pigments and it gives and thereby we come to the diagnosis of RP and the confirmatory investigation is retina or is electro Right? Let's go to the next question. This is a repeat question from one exam conducted, I mean, last year. A two-year-old child presents with leukocoria in the right eye for the past two months. And on examination, there is a total retina detachment and the B scan reveals a mass with calcification. What is the probable diagnosis? And you can see this picture. Very good. This, is, this gives us a diagnosis of retinoblastoma. Now, retinoblastoma, all of you know that this is the most common intraocular malignancy in children. This is the most, this is the most common intraocular malignancy in children. And the common, the presenting age is usually around one and a half to two years. So, see, they have mentioned that it is a two-year-old child and the pre most common presenting feature is leukocoria. What is leukocoria? It is white pupillary reflex. And when you do a USGB scan, why do you see this white pupillary reflex clinically? Because of this mass. So, see this mass that is present, this is the retinoblastoma and this is actually, you are able to see it through the pupil and that's what is giving us this kind of a white pupillary reflex. And when you do a USGB scan for, for this, then you get a mass with calcification. So, the presence of an intraocular mass with calcification on a B scan, this points to the diagnosis of retinoblastoma. Okay, Chalo. this was an easy question. Chalo. Let's go to the next question. Yeah, this is a slightly tough question. It's an old question. Uh, it's an old repeat question. A child presents with bilateral retinoblastoma. In the right eye, the tumor is filling the globe, whereas in the left eye, there is a mass which is measuring about 1 mm in diameter. Now, what is the management? So, what are the options? The options are enucleation of both the eyes, chemotherapy, enucleation of the right eye and focal therapy of the left eye and radiotherapy. So, what would you advocate for this patient? Correct. The answer is this. That is enucleation of the right eye and focal therapy of the left. Now say, how do you approach this question? So see, this question is talking about intraocular retinoblastoma, meaning retinoblastoma which is confined to the globe. That is, it has not spread outside. So when you get a question on intraocular retinoblastoma, they, generally, the question will talk about large masses or small masses. So, suppose the mass is large, that is, it is involving more than 50% of the globe, then there is no option but to remove the globe. So, for this, the answer is going to be enucleation. 
right? But if it is a small mass, meaning it is occupying less than 50% of the globe, then what we do is we do not enucleate, that is we don't remove the eye, but we just treat the mass and that is called as focal therapy. So this focal therapy can be either laser therapy, cryotherapy, brachytherapy, different options of focal therapy are available depending upon the location and the size of the mass. But the basic idea is that if it is a large mass, then you have to enucleate. That is, if the mass is more than 50% of the globe, then you have to go for enucleation. But if it is less than 50% of the globe, then you can go for focal. So see here in the right eye, the tumor is filling the globe, meaning obviously it's more than 50%. In the left eye, it is much lesser. The mass is measuring less than 1 mm in diameter, meaning it's a small mass. So that's why we go for focal therapy of the left eye. Right? Let's go to the next question. A patient presents with pain, redness and watering in the right eye. On examination, there is a large dry necrotic ulcer with feathery margins. And there are two small lesions beside the main ulcer. Now, what is the likely diagnosis? So the options given to us are bacterial ulcer, acantha amoeba keratitis, viral keratitis and fungal corneal ulcer. So, what will we should be mark out of here? Good. We should mark this as a fungal corneal ulcer. Now, why are we calling this as a fungal corneal ulcer? Because see, pain, redness and watering, this, then they have described the ulcer for us. Now, what are the key words which tell us that the diagnosis is going to be uh, a fungal ulcer? See, they have mentioned that the margins of the ulcer are feathery. So, typically to describe a fungal ulcer, we use the words fuzzy margins, ill-defined margins, indistinct margins or feathery margins. So, these words are going to be there in the question. Also, see, they have mentioned that it's a dry-looking ulcer. So, if the surface is mentioned as dry or leathery, then also that means that the diagnosis is a fungal ulcer. But the giveaway in the question is this, that there are two smaller lesions beside the main ulcer. What does this mean? This suggests that there are satellite lesions. So, satellite lesions means that there is one large ulcer and beside the larger ulcer, there are some smaller ulcers. That is why we are giving the diagnosis of a fungal corneal ulcer. So, if they say that there is one large ulcer with satellite lesions, the surface of the ulcer is dry and leathery, the margins are ill-defined, fuzzy or feathery, that these are the pointers in the question which give us a diagnosis of fungal corneal ulcer. Okay, so these are the questions that I had in store for you today. So this was like a quick session of MCQs. We'll soon be having another session. So in this session, I primarily went through the questions on retina and this one question on cornea. Next, uh, in the next session, we will have more questions on other, other important topics in ophthalmology also. So, those of you who are still not a part of our platform, do download the Unacademy app and start watching our special classes. And you can use my code DOCSUDHA to unlock and start watching the special classes. And on the PLUS platform, if you want to be a part of our PLUS platform, then do enroll for the PLUS subscription. And for that also, you can use my code DOCSUDHA. And this PLUS subscription, it gives you access to both our live and recorded classes and the opportunity to earn, to learn from some of the best educators of India for medical exams. And if you want to access access to two excellent platforms that is both an academy and a planner then you can go for this iconic subscription right now just to tell you a little bit about the important features on our platform see in the special classes we have our interactive special classes we are having polls for the learners and what a very very important feature is this raise a hand feature which is unique to our platform and this gives the learners a chance to talk to the educators in live classes and get the doubts resolved in real time 
Now, along with that, we also have an updated and a highly effective QBank, which has about 25,000 high yield clinical questions, and they have detailed explanations also. So this is going to simulate the true exam for you, and it gives you a chance to evaluate yourself also. So as I told you, we have this we have this raise a hand feature, which is which is something very unique and special to our plan. So these are the tests. These are the free test rituals and the plus bad rituals that we have. So this is something which you can keep a, a track of and you can participate in these test series and these marathons. And this will give you um, a feel of the real exam, the kind of questions that you can expect. And the discussions that follow will obviously be, be enriching for all of you. Right. So on our platform, as you all know, we are having we have batches which are curated exactly to whatever exam that you want to prepare for. So we have this FMG comprehensive badge for 2022, which is which is going to be a six month badge preparing the students for the FMG next year. Similarly, we have the Target PG 2022 test and discussion badge, which, which is going with. We are having a completely test and discussion kind of a module with an ultra fast revision, previous year's questions revision, etc. And on this 19th of December, we are having this NEET PG combat. So I would encourage all of you to participate in this. And it's at 5 p.m. There are 45 questions and uh, it's which are to be solved in a period of 60 minutes. And there are lots of scholarships and uh, prizes which are awaiting you. Right. So thank you, everyone. Uh, it was nice to have you in this session. And I look forward to see you in the remaining sessions and also to see you on our Unacademy platform in both the special classes as well as our plus classes. Bye-bye. See you soon.